David Crimen's remarkable The Chimp and the River. David, please welcome. David Crimen, of course, is a byline in National Geographic and uh, Outside Magazine and uh, uh, came here from Montana, which deserves an award in and of itself. <laughs> Thank you, David. Great to be here. David, uh, you have a story in uh, your book about epidemiology that uh, really was so moving. And uh, first of all, this is a story that takes us back to the 1970s and the 80s and the discovery of AIDS and the way in which it was a scourge uh, in the United States and around the world. Um, but then we're on a journey to discover what really was the transmission moment of uh, AIDS into the human population. And at one point in the book, you take us to a university in Zaire, a uh, pathologist, epidemiologist, a doctor who saves specimens. Can you describe that place and what it was like to be there and the characters that you met there? Yeah, yeah. Um, this this is, reflects one of my cardinal principles of, of nonfiction writing about science. Uh, I've got a handful of them, and I won't <coughs> recite them all, but one of them is, go there. Go there. Um, and it's not always possible financially or physically, but often it is, especially if you're fortunate enough, as, as we are, to have a little bit of financial support for your work. Um, that particular, that, that, that book, the little book, The Chimp in the River, is part of a larger book, and it's hard for me to talk about it separate from the larger book that it comes from, Spillover, which was 2012. But I wrote it as a set piece within Spillover, so when my publisher said, let's publish it separately, just the story of the ecological origins of the AIDS pandemic, I said, fine, yeah, let, I would like to do that. And at the core of that is, um, a couple of stories, but one of, the, one of them is the story of two specimens, the two very earliest HIV positive specimens from humans. And one of them was known to science uh, as early as the late 90s, and it was given the name, the genetic sequence of this HIV positive specimen was called um, ZR59, because it had been taken from a man who lived in what then was the country Zaire in, uh, well, what, what later was the country Zaire, uh, in 1959 at the point when it was still the Belgian Congo. And it was frozen, and it was rediscovered in the 90s, and that's when it was named ZR59, because it came from the year 1959. Here was a man who had... Um, had a blood sample taken and it had been frozen for all those years and retrospectively it was screened and discovered to have been HIV positive. He was living in what then was Leopoldville, the capital of, of the Belgian Congo. And then there was a second specimen that was discovered, uh, came to the attention of a scientist named Michael Warby and that was a tissue biopsy from a woman also in Leopoldville, Belgian Congo, in 1960. At the point when that was discovered, the country now is called DRC, Democratic Republic of the Congo. So that specimen was named DRC-60. It's very confusing because the names were changing, and the, you know, uh, but two specimens, one from 1959 and one from 1960. And when their genetic sequences were compared, uh, and the degree of difference between them was traced back using molecular clock assumptions. Um, this fellow, Michael Warby, established that AIDS had been in the human population since at least 1908, give or take a margin of error. So he placed the beginning of the AIDS pandemic in time using those two specimens and the comparison between them. And I read about this and I said, go there. So I went to, I, was, I happened to be in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, um, and I went to the University of Kinshasa, as it was then, uh, and found this man, Jean-Marie Kabongo, this wonderful little um, Congolese man with big mutton chops wearing a white coat who was head of the pathology department, and I said, I've come to see where that specimen resided where it was until it was rediscovered by Michael Warby and his colleagues. And this man took me through this pathology lab and he pushed aside a blue curtain 
and revealed a little dusty, disorganized pantry filled with tissue specimens preserved in paraffin and showed me that this was the place where that specimen had sat for 45 or 50 years at room temperature in the Congo, preserved in paraffin until it had found its way out of there, first to Belgium and then to the University of Arizona where Michael Warby extracted the DNA and sequenced it. Um, it's a miracle of science. And the idea that this sort of random, that these quiet little mm -hmm. priests and choir boys of pathology and whatever are taking this data and putting it away and you know it stays preserved and it, it, it helps to solve a puzzle that's absolutely crucial because of course AIDS, as you describe in this book, completely changes our understanding of what infectious disease is all about. Yeah, right, yeah. And it, it's, I mean, people like to read about people, people like to read about mystery stories. Um, and and I, I've said that before about, about this particular mystery and, and the others emerging diseases that I've described in Spillover, it was a very enjoyable book and in some ways an easy book to write because every new emerging disease, including this horrible one, uh, AIDS, including Ebola virus disease, every one of these new diseases begins as a mystery story. And the disease detectives, the epidemiologists, and the, and the uh, veterinary uh, ecologists, the people who go out and investigate these mysteries to figure out what is this new virus, where does it come from, how does it get into people, um, they're the Sam Spades, they're the Philip Marlowe's of these stories. Uh, and it's fun to tell those stories. A quick final question, and that uh, would be, um, what do you think the responsibility of your readers is to understand science, or the readers of the future is to understand science in, in any significant way? David? When you use the word responsibility, I started thinking of all of our responsibilities to our readers. In terms of the reader's responsibility to us, or to themselves, or to society, reading about science, I think that one of the things that comes first to mind is that they have a responsibility to be hard on us, to be demanding, to demand real reporting, to demand accuracy, to demand validated fact and quotation, and also have high expectations about artfulness. Uh, I don't think they should roll over and, um, and accept second-class work from us. They should really, really push us uh, to report accurately and shape beautiful literary works. Well, bearing in mind that it's about people and it has a narrative and uh, mm -hmm. it's uh, a hopeful story yeah. at the end. And our responsibility just is, about disease. Right, and our <laughs> responsibility is to entertain them yeah. Yeah. and make the pages turn as well as informing them.